take out a Bible and follow along. Turn with me to 2 Kings. We're going to be in 2 Kings 4 today. If uh, you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs in front of you. There's also some on the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center Bibles are yours to keep. If you don't have a Bible, take one of those home with you. It's our joy. Uh, we absolutely love giving Bibles away. I've given over, uh, I've given a couple hundred Bibles in the last handful of years away in ministry, and I absolutely love, love, love giving away Bibles. So thank you for funding that as a church. I appreciate it. And then And uh, if you don't have a a paper version, iPhone, iPad, Android, look up YouVersion, Y-O-U version, uh, probably the best Bible app that you'll find on your phone. So take a look with that. It's going to be 2 Kings 4, starting in verse 8. Um, We're going to be looking once again at another woman who knew what God's vision was for her, and she followed it. And this is going to be the last woman that we're going to look at out of the Old Testament. I've got one more next week out of the New Testament. And this is going to be the last one. Uh, So we're getting close to the end of the series. I know many of you have been enjoying this and we'll come with something else interesting and new following it. But uh, I really fell in love with this story this week when I found a video that we're going to watch a little later on during the sermon here. And I'll share that with you. The video is powerful, really, I think, helps set home the message we're going to get today. So let's jump right in. Let's look right at our text. Let's look at Second Kings eight, uh, Second Kings four, verses eight through ten to get started. And if you don't, if you don't have it, you can also see it probably on the screen beside me here. There it reads. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was. As often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. She said to her husband, "Behold, now." I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please, let us make a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. So the story begins with the mention of the man who is now serving as uh, the main spokesman for, for God's people, uh, the man by the name of Elisha. Uh, God had decided in this uh, time that it was the right time for Elisha to come and take over for his predecessor, another man you might know his name, a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah, if you don't know Elijah's story, was miraculously taken from the earth riding on a chariot of fire into heaven. And so Elisha is going and he's traveling through this little town called Shunem uh, as his job took him there. And he was what we might call, uh, so to speak, a, a traveling preacher of sorts. And he would go from town to town proclaiming God's will and God's word. Uh, we at that point then are introduced to this woman, um, this woman from Shunem. And it's interesting for me to note as I, as I read through the story that not as much what is said about her, it's important to see what is not said about her. Because we've been looking at some of these women, and and you'll note that there's been some common themes among many of the women we've looked at. The the women, you know, who were strikingly beautiful, the Bible would say, women like Sarah or Bathsheba or Esther or Abigail, right? We we heard that in Scripture. And and she wasn't listed as being necessarily beautiful. Um, She's not listed as being a, a great leader or a judge like Deborah was, right? Uh, she doesn't even, in the story, she doesn't even have a child who would one day become great, like Hannah or, or Jochebed, as we studied. So why even study about her, right, Pastor? Well, notice that this woman is described in verse 8 as a prominent or, or a great woman, you might say. And as we take a few minutes to study her story, I believe that we will find some qualities about her that will help us see why she is described in this very respectful way. Now, the very first reason that I see in it, the very first reason for this is her compassion. We'll see that right in the verses we just read, 2 Kings 4, 8 through 11. You see, this woman, for whatever reason, was willing to care for this preacher. And she must have been a, a pretty fantastic cook, frankly, because whenever Elisha, you know, he, he'd be out walking down the road, and uh-huh, I'm, I'm going that way. Uh-huh. Every time he would go by her house, he would stop at her house and eat, right? Any of you grandmas, really good cooks like that, right? Can you imagine just some strange guy walking down your road and then coming and knocking on the door going, I could smell something and it's good, will you let me come in, Right? 
Every time this guy walks by her house, he stops, he grabs some grub. So it's one of Elisha's favorite places, as we can tell from scripture. He gets some food whenever he stops and passes through Shunem. And so the woman, she enjoys Elisha's company so much that she goes to her husband and she asks him, honey, can we turn our house into a bed and breakfast? Right? Did you hear that in scripture? It was there. So they added a, a little room on the side of their house with a bed, with a table, with a chair, with a little lamp stand beside it. She wanted this man of God to feel as welcome and as comfortable as he could possibly be. And we can summarize what she did in this way. Uh, this woman saw Elisha's need for lodging and she cared enough to get involved. She was practicing hospitality. Romans 12.13 says that we should all be contributing to the needs of the saints practicing hospitality. Hebrews 13.2, it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, right? And that is precisely why we have this story, so that we can learn, among other things, the importance of practicing hospitality. In Matthew 25, uh, 31 through 40, when Jesus is speaking about his return from or return for judgment, um, how he's going to go on and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, he taught that among those who would be saved are those who showed compassion, who practiced hospitality. You see, folks, if, if one of our neighbors is sick and they need a hot meal, We just need to take them one, right? We just need to step out and be neighborly. We don't have to tell anybody about it. Just go and love and serve. If if we know a a family around who's struggling financially and their kids need a winter coat, you got a coat, bring them a coat. Or if you, you need to grab a couple other families, grab a couple other families. Go and meet that need. That is what the church is to be about. That is the people of God meeting the needs of those around them. God, as I prayed when we took our offering, has abundantly blessed so many of us. And I think at times we're almost reticent or or at least afraid or too prideful even to want to share that sometimes with others who we know obviously have need. It's one thing, you know, if we go and get a bunch of people and tell everybody, hey, look at my neighbor, they're broke, let's go take care of them. Well, that sometimes can be very embarrassing. But if you show up one day and go, hey, I just wanted to give you this. Just was thinking of you. Here you go. It's an incredible way for us to love and serve our neighbors. Now, we as a church, of course, have a benevolence fund. Our deacons oversee that, and we take care of some of those things like that. But more often than not, in the moment, many of us, we can be the hands and feet of Christ wherever we are if we just respond to those needs. So if we see somebody in our lives struggling, somebody going through tough times, We simply need to be there for them. And that is exactly what the Shemanite woman was doing. Now, Elisha wasn't going through tough times, but she saw that he had need. And the second thing I want you to notice about this woman, she's an incredibly content woman. Look at 2 Kings 4, 12 through 17. Uh, Specifically in 12 and 13, it says, (coughs) excuse me, then he said to Kazazi, this is Elisha, his servant, call this Shemanite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, Say now to her, Behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you be spoken for to the king or perhaps to the captain of the army? And then listen to this. And then she answered. She said, I live among my own people. Now think about this for a moment. Here we have Elisha. He's been staying in this little room that she's prepared for him by this woman and and her husband. And he's appreciative of all that she's done for her or for him. And so he says to her, he says, hey, I've got a little bit of pull. I know the king. I know the commander of his armies, right? I kind of owe you a bit of a favor, don't I? So just tell me, Elisha says, give me the word and I'll see that it's done for you. 
What would you have done? What, what could I put a good word in for you on? What would you have me do here, he's asking. Now, some might have asked for, you know, uh, could have said, well, maybe I could get a job working for the king, right? Or, or maybe, well, maybe he'll just cut my taxes a little bit. That'd be great, right? Everybody, who, who wouldn't want a tax cut, right? Or, or, or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I could get a job overseeing uh, cooking for the general and his army. That might be a pretty neat job, right? She could have easily asked to have been put on the king's payroll or put on the king's staff or the general's. And some might have tried for that or some other form of whatever the government might provide. But look closely at her response, that last little part of the verse. And it's easy to miss it if you, if you, don't, if you don't drill down on it. And what she is saying here is she's saying, hey, I appreciate your offer, but I've got a home. I live among my people. I've got a home. My basic needs are provided for. I've already got what I need. I don't need anything else. You see, she wasn't acting out of selfish motivation. She wasn't wondering, well, if I do this for him, what's he going to do for me? You know, the quid pro quo. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. She, she wasn't serving him. She wasn't showing him hospitality to get something out of it. She had an active reason to love, and it was her God. She didn't need more than that. So instead of out of selfish motive, motivations, she's just loving and serving, providing a place for Elijah to stay. She does it as an act of devotion to God. So this great woman, she, she turns down the prophet's offer. And here's the bottom line that I want you to see in her life. She's content, right? You see, we live in a society where everyone wants more, right? More, more, more. Gimme, 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 right? We want a a better job, a bigger house, and a better bass boat. That's kind of the way life works for many in our world, right? Right? Bigger, better, faster. Newer, shinier. Right? That's what so many people are driven by. And she's content. And if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is filled with examples of God's people who were not content. Right? Think about this. God would deliver his people from bondage. From bondage in Egypt. But it's not long until they start to complain, right? God frees them from Egypt, and what do the Israelites do when they get to the Red Sea? They start to complain, right? They start to complain. And then God delivers them again. He parts the Red Sea. He frees them. They get to the other side. And what do they do when they get there? They start to complain. So God sends them into the wilderness, right? What do they do in the wilderness? They complain. They gripe, they complain, they whine, they whinge, they moan. They get out into the wilderness. They start complaining, we don't have any water. God gives them water. We don't have any food. God gives them manna. We're tired of manna. God gives them quail. We ate all the quail, now our stomach hurts. Seriously, they complained. They complained about eating too much quail. I don't know. But they complained. They were, they were never content. The Old Testament is filled with many other examples, of course. And, and what, what is the secret to being content then? Let me let you in on that secret. The secret to being content is perspective. It's just simply perspective. It's not how much money you have in the bank. It's not how big your house is or how new your car is. Most people in this world will not be content because instead they want a little bit more, right? And it's not what you don't have that matters. Rather, it's being thankful for that which you do have. Perspective. The New Testament speaks about the importance of being content. 1 Timothy 6, 6-8 says this, 
But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food, if we have covering, with these we shall be content. Or how about Philippians 4.11? It says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatsoever the circumstances I am in. That's the Apostle Paul, right? You know Paul's story? He was content in some pretty dire places. Paul gets arrested. He gets thrown in jail. He gets shackled, chained to another man so he can't escape. Paul's like, praise the Lord, I'm content. Not only am I content, I'm going to convert this guy while I'm here. Let me tell you about Jesus, right? That's Paul's secret. He's whipped, he's beaten, he's chased out of numerous towns, he's imprisoned, persecuted, and eventually killed. And in all of that, Paul goes, Yeah, God's provided my every need. I am content. And this Shemanite woman's response tells us that she was content as well with what she had. And as a result of her attitude, God honored her contentment by promising her a son within a year. And of course, as always, God's promise comes true. If you're following along, look at verse 17. It says, The woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year, as Elisha had said to her. And as we move on to the the next point here, it's her contentment that enables her to show confidence. Look at uh, 2 Kings 4.18. Now there's a a window of time that elapses here. Maybe four or five years of time, there's a gap between verse 17 and verse 18 because now we find in the story she has a little boy. And this little boy is now old enough to be out with her father among the reapers, back out in the field, right? The son is with the father. But, as the story tells us, if you read through the story, the little boy becomes ill. He becomes sick. So, so dad, as I think most of us dads would do, says, go see mom. Right? Not that dads can't take care of sick kids, but when my little guy's sick, he wants Mom. I'm a poor substitute for mom. So, so he sends his boy into mom. And if you know the story, you know what happens. The little boy ends up dying on the mother's lap. You talk about a terrible tragedy. What a, what a tremendous blow to this mother. But I want you to notice what she does. Verse 21. Verse 21 says, She went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. And she shut the door and she went out. You see, she didn't lay the body of her son on his bed. She didn't take his little body and put him on her bed. She didn't call the undertaker and say, You come get him. Instead, she goes and she places him on the bed of the one who had promised him to her. The one who had said that she would give birth to him. Thus showing her faith that God would, through Elisha, help her out. She doesn't know how, but she has faith. We too need to take our problems to God and put our faith in him. You see, God will always make a way for you to be able to get through your tragedies in life, no matter how hard they might seem in the moment. This woman's great confidence was in the power and the presence of her God. And this is ah, this is this is the this is where I really want you to focus in and hear this. This is the part of the story that just touches me so much. I, I, I believe that it was because of this woman's contentment that she was able to show such tremendous faith in this devastating, 
heartbreaking crisis of her life. Let's read 22 and 23. It says, Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys, that I might run to the man of God and then return. The husband says, Why will you go to him today? It's neither a new moon nor a Sabbath. And hear what she says in response. She says, It will be well. It will be well. You see, uh, it seems in this story, the woman, at this moment at least, wishes to conceal the death of their son from her husband until she gets a chance to go and see what Elisha might have to say about it. She probably knew the story of Elijah, his predecessor, right? Elijah, once upon a time, has, had resurrected a young lad from the dead. And so maybe she's hoping for a similar form of miracle to occur on her behalf. And the woman tells her husband that she just wants to go visit Elisha. But she doesn't tell him why. He says, well... It's not the Sabbath. It's not the new moon. I mean, occasions where it would be appropriate, where, where, where Israelites would go to a prophet of God and go and sit and listen and learn and, and hear what they might teach. But no, that's not the reason. She doesn't tell him at all about her son. Instead, she simply says to him, Shalom. That's the Hebrew word. Shalom. Peace. It is well. It will be well. So he's like, all right. He grants her her wish. And she's believing that everything is going to be all right, it would seem. So she grabs the donkey. She goes and she meets up with Elisha up near Mount Carmel. And Elisha, he sees this woman coming down the road, right? He's like, I know her. Why is she coming out here? Why is she coming here? Why is she, why is she coming this way? So, so he says to his servant, he says, Hey, run down the road. Go, go, go check out. Verse 26 says, Run down the road. It says, Please run and meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Right? I mean, if she's coming, something bad must have happened. Is it, is it well with your husband? Is it, is it well with your child? Her answer to the servant? It is well. Shalom. Was everything all right? By no means, right? She knew her son was dead. A son, a son she had never even asked for. But a son she had definitely grown to love. Her only child, who had died on her lap. Maybe some of us here can identify with that. And in that moment, how hard is it to say, it is well in my soul. I'm at peace. How hard is it to say, no, I'm content and everything is all right. But that, that's what this woman says. How could she say this? She had confidence in God and in the man of God, Elisha, that they could make things better. She was about to ask the prophet to do something unprecedented. And she didn't even know whether or not he would even do it, or could do it for that matter. But she knew, no matter what, that everything was going to be all right. And here's the point that I want to make. On two separate occasions, this woman says, Shalom. It is well. Meaning, She was at peace in spite of just losing her son. Folks, that's faith. When when she finally meets up with Elisha, she says to him in verse 28, she says, did I even ask for this? Did I ask for this son from my Lord? You see, she never asked for a son. She didn't ask Elisha for anything. She said then, when you told me, Elisha, you were going to give me a son, when when God was going to bless me, when, when God, you know, I was childless, and when you told me God's going to stir my womb, I'm going to have a baby, I told you, do not deceive me. Right? She, she asks two rhetorical questions here, and that's all she really needs to say. She doesn't, she'd never ever complained about her childlessness. 
when the opportunity came to ask, she doesn't even ask for a child. She doesn't ask the prophet to help her get a son. And when Elisha had given her this promise, she begs him. She says, don't, don't, don't play with my emotions in my heart. Don't deceive me, she says. Don't make me... I don't want to be the... It's hard to talk with my hands with a microphone in it, but I'll do my best. She, she never asked for this situation to come. She didn't say, Elijah, because I've blessed you, bless me with a child. No, none of that. And now this has happened. And Elijah quickly realizes what's going on. And so Elijah sends Gehazi, his, his assistant, sends him down the road back to where she lives with his own staff. You know, this, this staff that he carried with him, this staff that, that showed his power and his prominence. And he says, Gehazi, go, go take my staff, run to their house, and go, go, put it, go put it on the boy. Lay it on the boy's body. Look at verse 30. It says, the mother of the boy said, As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And then it says that Elijah rose and he followed her. Elijah sending back his servant to touch the boy's body wasn't good enough for her. She wasn't going back unless Elijah, unless Elijah came back with her. Now Elijah was the, the man of God and to this woman he was her direct link to her God. And no matter what the end result, no matter what the outcome, no, no matter whether her son would live or die, and he was already dead, but no matter what was going to happen, she wasn't going to leave God or leave the man of God who had promised her this son until he responds. I mean, have you ever, have you ever experienced this? Maybe you know somebody who's, who's just had a tragedy, right? So, something terrible is going on in their life, and, and it's just, oh, it's a, it's a horrible, terrible train wreck of a thing. And so they go to God, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, and nothing happens. God doesn't answer that prayer. And what do they do? They blame God. They get angry at God. They turn their backs on God, right? We see that happen, don't we? Listen. God hears and answers our prayers, but sometimes... We don't like the answer. Sometimes we don't understand the answer. And that doesn't mean, folks, that he's against us. That doesn't mean he's quit loving us. That doesn't mean he's quit caring for us. It doesn't mean certainly in any way that he's punishing us. God's will for a greater purpose is often hard for us to see and understand. And no matter the outcome, no matter how things might turn out for us in certain situations, we've got to have an attitude like this woman. We've got to tell God, I will not leave you, regardless of the way this turns out. And that is exactly what this woman is saying. She wasn't going to give up on Elijah, and she wasn't going to give up on her God, no matter what. I want to stop here for a little moment and share with you about a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. Some of you will be familiar with him. Many of you may not know him, but we're going to watch a video on him here in a second. And I would say pay attention to when and why he wrote the words to his song, It Is Well With My Soul. Joey? Horatio Spafford was a well-known lawyer and businessman in Chicago in the 1860s, where he lived with his wife Anna and their five children. He had invested heavily in real estate along the shores of Lake Michigan. He was a prosperous man and a devout Christian. However, in 1870, a series of events began to turn Horatio's world upside down. That year, Horatio and Anna's only son died of scarlet fever at the tender age of only four.
A year later, while the Spaffords were still grieving the loss of their son, the Great Chicago Fire broke out and destroyed nearly every one of Horatio's investments. His entire life savings was gone. Aware of the toll these disasters had taken on his family, Horatio decided to take his wife and four daughters on a holiday to England, where they planned to accompany the famous evangelist D.L. Moody on his next crusade. However, just before they set sail, a last-minute business development forced Horatio to delay. Not wanting to ruin the family holiday, he persuaded his family to go on as planned and he would follow along later. With this decided, Horatio stayed in Chicago while Anna and the girls boarded the French steamship Ville du Havre to set sail for England. But several days later, Horatio received devastating news. The Ville du Havre had been struck by an iron sailing vessel from England. The ship sank in only 12 minutes, claiming the lives of 226 passengers. It was the worst disaster in naval history until the sinking of the HMS Titanic 40 years later. The next day, he received a telegraph from Anna from Wales. It read these six words. Survived alone. What should I do? The Spafford's four daughters were among those who perished. After hearing the terrible news, Horatio boarded the next ship out of New York to join his bereaved wife. During his voyage, the captain of the ship called him to the bridge. A careful reckoning has been made, he said, and I believe we are now passing the very place where the Ville du Havre sank. And it was there while staring into the watery grave of his beloved daughters, that Horatio penned the words to the great hymn, It is well with my soul. As I was reading about Horatio Spafford this week, I couldn't help but wonder if he knew the story of this Shemanite woman and what it is that she said after the death of her son. And the point that I want to make is simply this. My prayer is that all of us can have the faith of this man and of the Shemanite woman so that we too can say, it is well with my soul before we even know the end of our trial. Now, I love the ending of this story with the Shemanite woman. It's a classic, if you're not familiar. The, the staff that has, he goes and he lays, and he, he lays this staff from Elisha on the boy's body and nothing happens. The little boy is still dead. So then Elisha comes. He follows the woman and he comes. He comes and he puts his body down on top of this boy's body. No doubt he's following the example of his predecessor, Elijah, who had done the same thing when he had resurrected a boy from the dead. Elisha, Elisha lays down on top of him. First Kings, or in Second Kings, uh, there he's, 
doing what Elijah did in 1 Kings 17. And as Elisha lays there, warmth begins to come back into this boy's body. And soon, he comes back to life. In that moment, Elisha calls for the boy's mother. Come and get him. Verse 37 says, Then she went in. She went into the room where the prophet had normally stayed. She went in, and notice, she fell down at his feet, and she bowed herself to the ground. Notice, she takes up gratitude first. And then she takes up her boy and goes out with him. If we have a confident faith in the power and presence of God, then we too can get through tragedy, through sickness, through death of a loved one. You name it, we can get through it. And like the Shemanite woman, we too can have a faith that shows compassion We too can show hospitality to strangers. We too can be content with what it is we have. And then we can have complete confidence in the power and presence of our God. She had a faith that said, no matter what. No matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to my family, it is well. No matter what. If that too is our faith, God will see us through anything that might come before us. Let's pray.